Good morning. My name is Josh, and I get to uh, I get to serve as pastor here at Cowdersport Alliance. And uh, just want to say a huge thank you to a young man who might not still be here, but Mr. Aiden Long walked up with this beautiful gift. <laughs> this is homemade maple syrup. Um, I'm sorry for the Aunt Jemima lovers in the room, but um, there's nothing like homemade maple syrup. Um, so thank you, Mr. Aiden and the Long family. So um, we're nearing the end of this series about spiritual gifts. We've got this week and next week. And you've heard me say this a couple times if you've been here the last few weeks. My hope and my prayer is that we would grow in both our understanding and the utilization of the gifts that God's given us. That's why we're doing this. We believe that God is a God who longs to give good gifts to his children. You know, Jesus talks about that in Matthew, right? What father among you, if his son would ask for a a loaf of bread, would give him a snake instead, right? We've we've got this God who, who longs to give us good gifts. And I just want to say thank you to you as a church um, over this last four weeks. I really sensed you leaning in. And you have asked more questions of me in these last four weeks than I've had probably in the last four months that has to do with this series. And that tells me two things. One, that you're really leaning in, and that's encouraging to me. But two, that like, it affirms like this is where God has us as a church right now. I'll let you inside uh, of the insecurities of a pastor uh, for just a minute and explain to you that not every series goes this way. (laughs) Not every series do people um, start talking about it with their friends and their families. Not every series do I get phone calls and emails and text messages. But when it happens, it's, it's it's a real gift for me as a pastor. There's this one question that keeps coming up over and over and over again. And I've probably answered this question personally three or four times. But I feel like it's really important for us to understand something specific in relationship to spiritual gifts. And so this question, I've had fantastic conversations around, but I feel like it's a church conversation we need to have. And here's the question, I hope. If I am a follower of Christ, and I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me, then why do I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's be honest, who's ever asked that or thought that of yourself? Like, hey, if I'm a Christian, come on, be honest, look around. That's about mm, 35% of the room. The question is, if I'm a follower of Jesus, if Christ is not just someone I believe in, but that someone I trust for my forgiveness of sins and for my hope of heaven, And if the Holy Spirit is living inside of me, then then why do I, what is this filling of the Spirit all about? Why do I have to keep going back and being filled? I want to try something today. I hope this helps. Because it's a bit complex, this question. All right. Sorry if you're thirsty, you can go get a drink, just don't drink this. Can we all agree that this is a a water jar? We're good with that? Everybody agree that like, typically you put water or other kinds of liquids inside that are meant for refreshing, right? Can we all agree that right now, this water jar is empty? Completely empty, but it's still a water jar, right? But it's not a water jar until what happens? So you put water in it. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna use this as an illustration for a moment. Would you imagine that this water jar represents the fullness of you as a person, body, soul, and spirit, right? We know from scripture that there's three parts of us, our physical bodies, our souls, which are eternal, and our spirit or mind, right, our personalities, right? So can we, for just a minute, imagine that this is you, okay? And we're all given this 
body, soul, and mind by God when we're brought into this world. And all of us have this, this choice to make, right? We have a choice, and you know where I'm going. What do we fill our lives with? What do we fill our time with? What do we fill our thoughts with? You see, that's the choice. The choice that all of us is given, are given as, as humans, that's what makes us different than the rest of the animal kingdom. You ever thought about that? The rest of the animal kingdom doesn't get to like, think about tomorrow. right? They don't get to like, imagine a different future. Right? The rest of the animal kingdom, they spend their entire lives fight, flight, or freeze. Right? They're just trying to stay alive. But us, we're given this gift, this gift of life. And, and each of us, we, I'll just argue that we're a lot like this water jar. And God gives this thing to us called free will. Free will is where we get to make a choice for ourselves, how we're going to spend our time, where we're going to put our energies, what's going to matter to us, what's going, what's going to be of value to us. And each of those values, right, each of those things that we care about, they become things that we put into our lives. And so as we're talking about being a follower of Christ, and at some point, when you decide to follow Jesus, you make the decision, you know what? I'm going to receive the Holy Spirit into my life. Right? I've chosen to receive the Holy Spirit. And Ephesians 1, we're going to get there in just a minute, but it talks about this idea that, that when, we are, when we put our faith and hope and trust in Jesus, we're given the Holy Spirit as a seal over our hearts. Okay, so now can we all agree that this has become a water jar? Before it was a jar. Now it's a water jar. But is this water jar full? Is it, is it full of water or just have water in it? Just has water in it. There is air in there too. Thank you, science lady. <laughs> Along the way, we have these choices to make. We have these choices to make about what we fill our lives with. And somewhere along the line, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you chose to invite the Holy Spirit into your life. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us, Ephesians 1, as a seal over our hearts. But guess what? There's still room for all kinds of other stuff. You see that? There, there's still room in our lives for all kinds of other things that we can decide to fill it with. So I'll argue that when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of our water jars, that Ephesians 1, 13, it becomes a seal. We, we become a water jar. We become a follower of Jesus Christ. But then we're given still the free will after making the decision to follow Jesus. We're still given the free will to decide what else we fill the rest of our lives with. What we value, what matters to us. So what happens when I add more water, right? If, if the water represents the Holy Spirit, right? If I add some more water... Can I ask the question, are we now full of the Holy Spirit? Are we now full of water? Okay. Uh, I hope this works because I didn't measure. If it doesn't, I'm going to be running down the hall and I'll be right back. The more experiences we have with the Holy Spirit, the more we put ourselves in, in place of God. Who's got water with them? Because I know, I'm, oh, there's more. Thank you. I love you, Susan. <laughs> The more experiences we have with the Holy Spirit, the more we surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit, the, the more that we allow the Holy Spirit to take up residence inside of us, the more full we become of the Holy Spirit, right? We're getting closer. Are we there yet? No. Okay. Not quite full of the Spirit. We continue to walk in grace. We continue to choose Jesus. We continue to spend time in his word. We continue to, to, to worship. We continue to surrender more and more of our lives to God. And it, you notice it crowds out the room for much else along the way. And the more that we choose to be filled with the Holy Spirit, are we getting there? Getting close? Okay, good. Can we argue it's full now? What happens if I do this? 
Oh, it's the full to overflowing. <laughs> what did Jesus call himself? Living water. That out from you would flow streams of living water. So the more full we become the Holy Spirit, the, the more it flows out of our lives. And in answer to this question, in answer to this, this question as, as to why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit even after we have accepted the Holy Spirit into our lives, here's my answer. We leak. We do. And, and the leak kind of comes out in lots of different ways, right? We pour ourselves into the lives of others, right? We, we share the love of Jesus Christ with people and, you know, we, we serve in the context of our church and, you know, and we make some decisions that are in regards to our family and you, you see what happens, right? Like these investments, we, we just we have a tendency to keep giving of ourselves and to pour out and to pour out and to pour out. But the problem is, as we pour out, who's, who's pouring back in? Right? It's sometimes, sometimes it's not as benevolent as, as loving on our families and making good decisions. Sometimes, sometimes we kind of get knocked around in life, don't we? Yeah, me too. I, that's for you, Dorothy. Don't we? Like, our, our, we kind of get rocked and the Holy Spirit kind of spills out all over the place. And then, and then sometimes, I don't know about you, but life gets kind of hard and, and kind of hot and arid and it begins to evaporate. See, you see, the problem is, in this journey, as we're trying so hard to follow Jesus, as we're trying so hard to, to live by the Holy Spirit, as we're trying so hard to, to use our spiritual gifts, what happens is we begin to leak. And I'll say it this way. There is a significant difference between the indwelling and the filling of the Spirit. Okay, The indwelling of the Spirit, I'll say it this way, all followers of Christ are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, right? That's the bare minimum. That when we put our faith and hope and trust in Jesus Christ, you know, it was just above the water line, right? And according to what I see in Scripture, Luke chapter 12, verse 10, Jesus says the only unforgivable sin is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That means to, like, deny that Jesus is God as the Holy Spirit leads you. And so, no matter how long We've been followers of Christ. The Holy Spirit is there with us. That all followers of Christ are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And therefore, by being marked sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. He is our deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So this is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is the moment where we go from being a jar to being a water jar. We go from being a person to be a follower of Christ. And we know that the Holy Spirit seals our heart. But that does not, sometimes, okay, just to be honest with you, you can see it in Scripture and you can see it in people's lives. Sometimes at the moment when they make a decision to follow Jesus, like it just gets poured out to overflowing in their lives. You ever seen that? Where like they, they don't just get the minimum, they get like this m like massive overflowing of the Holy Spirit. You can see it in Acts, a couple different places. You can see it in Ephesians, right? But all followers of Christ have the Holy Spirit as a seal, as a minimum, inside of us. But then, just a couple chapters later in Ephesians, Paul tells us to do this thing that, that is kind of confusing. Ephesians chapter 5, he, he kind of helps us understand that Ephesians 1, all followers of Christ are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. But then he says all followers of Christ must choose to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Doesn't that seem a little bit duplistic? It's in Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Okay, so here's the truth. If, if Paul is saying that we can be filled with the Spirit, guess what? We can empty ourselves of the Spirit. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit to decide I'm not going to follow Jesus anymore. To let go of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
So here's my answer. In regards to the question, if I am a follower of Jesus Christ and have the Holy Spirit living inside of me, then why do I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because we leak. We have a tendency to take up worries and doubts and fears. We have a tendency to to find ourselves in unrepentant sin. We do things that break God's heart and hurt people around us. And in doing all of that, we leak. We leak the Holy Spirit. Not to the point where it's an empty water jar again, unless you decide to. Luke chapter 12, verse 10, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But, but to the point where we're filling our lives with all these other things that, that God never intended for us. Okay, so I, I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 1. And, and I, I, th- I need to kind of flesh this all out. I, I hope the illustration makes sense. But I need to take some time this morning to help you understand what what Paul really means in Ephesians chapter 1 when when he's talking about the seal of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit, okay? And I just want to give you a few examples because I'll say this again. There's a huge difference between the indwelling and the filling of the Spirit. Sometimes they happen simultaneously and sometimes They are sequential. Sometimes they happen later in coming to Christ. But there is a difference. All followers of Christ are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Paul says it again in 1 Corinthians 3. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? Like this this is the core of what it means to follow Jesus, friends. That the Holy Spirit lives in us, that we become the residence of God when we choose to follow Jesus. It's said again in 2 Timothy 1, what you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Jesus Christ. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Why do we have to guard the deposit of the Holy Spirit if, if we don't leak? If we don't have this tendency to like fill our lives with other things, to drift away from what we know to be true. One more verse to reinforce that all of us, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit if we choose to follow Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Right? That's why Paul can say, it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. That the more I die, the more that he lives, right? That, that whole beautiful, complex, wonderful journey of discipleship. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain, says Paul, right? What he's saying is that when Christ comes to take up residence, when the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence inside of our souls, we begin this journey of dying to ourselves and our ways and our desires and and surrendering that to the filling of the Holy Spirit. That's the core, what it means to follow Jesus. But then there's like the same question that we had before. So if we have the Holy Spirit living in us, then then why must we go back for a filling? Why must we be refilled? And Ephesians 1, I want to unpack, sorry, Ephesians chapter 5, I want to unpack this statement, right? Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Okay. Um, It's reinforced again in Acts chapter 6. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit. Again, if someone can be full of the Spirit, then they can be not so full of the Spirit. And wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over them. Acts chapter 19, Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so they believed in Jesus. They got baptized with water. And then verse 6, but when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. This is a subsequent filling of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it happens simultaneously and sometimes it's sequentially. In order, let me remind us, the whole reason we're we're in this series is that we will become a church. 
that we would become a church where each person, every single one of us, knows and grows in our spiritual gifts for God's glory and for the overall health of the body of Christ. This is what's at stake when we're talking about the indwelling and the filling of the Spirit. We're talking about God's glory. We're talking about lives being changed. We're talking about communities being transformed. We're talking about cultures being shifted away from the kingdom of darkness towards the kingdom of light. This is the whole purpose of this series. Okay, and let me just, let me pause here for a second because I, let me just pause here for a second because I know that in this room there are some people who have been hurt by this journey. I know that there's some, there's some pain even in the context of this church historically around the issue of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Spirit and the indwelling of the Spirit. So let me just say this very, very clearly. In this series, in, in this season as a church, we're not just chasing after the Holy Spirit. We are chasing after spiritual wholeness in Christ. And spiritual wholeness requires us to regularly surrender our lives to the Holy Spirit. Okay? Can I say that again? We're not just chasing after the Holy Spirit, not just the feelings, not just the experiences, and they are amazing. And they are gifts from God. But the goal in this series is not just to chase the Holy Spirit. It is to chase spiritual wholeness by surrendering our lives to the work of the Holy Spirit, to be filled with him. Okay. Tozer says it this way. For the Holy Spirit to work in my life, I need to surrender all my authority and all my power back to him. Okay. So if the Holy Spirit's going to work in my life, I have to give up all the other things that fill my life. And then for the Holy Spirit to work in our church life today, we need to surrender absolutely to the Holy Spirit. That this is what's at stake. Spiritual wholeness requires us to surrender all those things that are not of Jesus. But I'll be honest with you, this isn't like a simple, or what I even call a tidy process. It's messy. But can I ask you, if, if following the Holy Spirit, or surrendering to the Holy Spirit wasn't messy, wouldn't we just be trying to control the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't we just be trying to manipulate God? If there wasn't like a messiness and if there, were, if there wasn't a mystery to, to the filling of the Holy Spirit, if there, if there wasn't a, a, a divine mystery to what it means to surrender ourselves fully to the work of the Holy Spirit, if that wasn't there, wouldn't we just be trying to control the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't we just be trying to manipulate God? And that's the danger in all of us, right? We talked about it last week, the shadow side, that there are really two questions at place, right? What is our motivation and what is our source of strength? And this, this is what can prevent us from getting into those places where we try to manipulate or control the Holy Spirit or manipulate or control God or the gifts of the Spirit, right? It all comes back to the real why, the depths of our soul. Why do we want that spiritual gift? Why, why do we want to use our spiritual gift? And are we doing it on our own power, our own strength, of the strength and power that God alone provides? All right, so I'm going to just stop and ask, like, how'd your homework go last week? How'd that process go where I, where I invited you to, to go back through 18 of the primary spiritual gifts and watch for the abuses and misuses and neglect of those? Because really, that, that's one of the dangers. Primary dangers is a lack of information with regards to the indwelling and the filling of the Holy Spirit, and the other danger is that we would abuse, misuse, and neglect the spiritual gifts. All right, we're going back to Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 18, and i got to unpack this one phrase. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, uh, be filled is actually one word in Greek, just so you know. And Greek is the original language that, um, that the New Testament was written in. You're, if you're not familiar with the Bible, that's why I'm talking about Greek. It was, the, it was the original language. And that word, be filled, right here, 
That's two words in English. One word is peruste. Peruste means, in the Greek, it's a verb. It means to fill entirely, to cram in. I like that one. When was the last time you felt like you were crammed in by the Holy Spirit? <laughs> to fully level up, right? To like level up to the hundredth power. This is how the word peruste was used often in Greek. But there's something that you need to know about about Greek, and, and I think I've shared this before, but I'll say it again. In the Greek, there are, there's a voice, there's a, there's a person, there's a tense, and a tone, right? There's four different components to every Greek verb. And if we don't understand what Paul is saying when he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, we miss this incredible opportunity to walk in the goodness of God. And so this word, parousthe, to fill entirely, to cram in, to level up, to, to be full... Actually, it has what they call the imperative voice, right? So the imperative voice in Greek is this is a command. So first thing I need you to know is that to be filled is not an option. <laughs> it's not, a, you know, it's just not something we can just decide to or not to do, right? It's a command by God through Paul in Ephesians chapter 5. It's an imperative. This is an absolute must. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the imperative voice. Then we need to know that it's in the second person. Paul's not saying, I am being filled with the Holy Spirit. He's saying, you are to be. He's not saying, I am supposed to do this. He's not, just, he's not letting all of us off the hook by, by using first person. He's using second person. He's saying, second person, you must, you are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Then you need to know that there, it's the present tense. Okay? So, why would it matter that peruste is in the, in the present tense? Because where is the present? Now. And now again. And now again. Right? According to the Greek, peruste is a command to all of us that now, today, every day. Right? And ongoing. It's not a past tense. It's not a future tense. Paul doesn't say, you should have been filled. He doesn't say, you will be filled. He's saying you are to be filled by the Holy Spirit. And finally, it's a passive tone. Notice, notice what, what Paul is saying. I command you to be filled today, but yet it's being done to you. There's, there's this passive tone to it. It's not like you can fill yourself with the Holy Spirit. See, that's where the danger of abusing and misusing and neglecting the Holy Spirit, right? Like, that's where that comes in, is that Paul's not saying that we have to do the filling, but we do have to put ourselves in the place where we can be filled. I like how the International Standard Version puts it. So, this is so important. It's a command that we today would be filled, that that, that filling is being done to you, the ISV says it this way, Stop getting drunk with wine, which leads to wild living, but keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Keep on being filled. That this is like today and tomorrow and the next day and the day after that and the day after that and the day after that and the day after that. That we would continue to come back to be filled with the Holy Spirit because we leak. Because we fill our lives with things that are not of God. In the Alliance, I'm going to give you a definition for this, a phrase that we use often, and it's called expectation without agenda. The Alliance is, is the denomination that we're part of, Christian Missionary Alliance. And this whole process of, of keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit is that every day we would expect the Holy Spirit to fill us, but not demand how he does that. Daily surrendering to the personal work of the Spirit, right? It opens us up to the Holy Spirit moving in our lives. And we expect Him to move. We expect Him to fill. We expect Him to use us. But we don't do it for our own agenda. For our own good. Or so that the world might see us. Or so that we might have some experience with the Holy Spirit. But so that... God would receive the glory. Expectation without agenda is what 
I believe it means the difference between the indwelling and the filling of the Holy Spirit. That we come daily before God and we say, Holy Spirit, where would you have me to go today? Holy Spirit, how would you fill me today? Holy Spirit, how would, how would you have me to pour out into the lives of others? What, what does it look like for, for me to be filled with you today to the point of overflowing and that we begin to spill out over into the lives of others? It, it's not just about choosing to follow Jesus one time. It's not just about choosing to follow Jesus one time. It's not just about choosing to invite the Holy Spirit into our lives one time. It's about daily coming with open hands and surrendering. That we would be filled. Expectation without agenda. For God's glory. For the good of the church. So that his kingdom might come. So that his will might be done. You ever notice that, I'm going to say it this way, our souls, as followers of Christ, we crave a connection with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. And if we don't fill that craving with the Holy Spirit, you notice we often wind up filling it with other less holy things. I mean, I think that's why Paul is so clear in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where he starts talking about, like, do not get drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Like, we have this craving inside of us to be with our Father, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, we wind up longing for other things, less holy things, and we begin to fill our lives with those. And then we wonder why we're miserable. We wonder why God feels so far away. In order to be empowered by the Holy Spirit for the use of our spiritual gifts, we must regularly surrender our lives to the filling of the Spirit. We also must know the, the temptations we have to fill our lives with other things. Do you know yours? Do you, do you know the temptations that you have to fill your life with other things and those longings, those soul cravings that you have? When they're not filled with the Holy Spirit, they will be filled with something. But in order for us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, to use the spiritual gifts for God's glory and for the the good of the kingdom of God, we must regularly surrender our lives today. Keep on surrendering today to the filling of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to close with this question, and I don't have an answer yet. This is part of the messiness of the filling of the Holy Spirit, but I'll ask you, What would it look like for you to surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit today? What's that part of your life right now that it's taken up space that God never intended it to? What's that thing that has taken up residence in your mind and you just can't stop thinking about it? What's that issue that just is eating you up inside? It's that relationship that you just can't seem to fix. What would it look like for you to empty yourself of those things so that you could be filled with the Holy Spirit today? I don't know your answer, but I believe the Holy Spirit does. So can we just end our time together this morning, a moment of silence? And can we just give God permission with this question? Can we ask God? Would you pray with me?